return to Croatia? Yes, yes. What do you make of it? It's wonderful, isn't it's, it? It's amazing. It's just it's, um, a wonderful I was, place. I've heard all the myths and the phrases. The myths? Yeah. <laughs> Nee, genau. Und ich glaube, in dem, in dem letzten, den wir bekommen, stand noch 2015, aber in dem, im Programm im Internet steht halt auch 45. Und das wird er aber ja wohl nach. Das wäre jedenfalls sehr witzig. Also im Programm steht auch als I studied um, for six months at a place called Lambeth College, where yeah. my background was, they taught me how to do shorthand, yeah. they taught you how to write a news story, uh, they taught you a little bit about media law, and they taught you a little bit about public affairs, yeah. and that was it. But then, yeah. I'm showing my age a little bit, uh, yeah. but it was, it was very basic, but it was, it was teaching you basically, here's how you write a 500 word news story, and here's some facts you need to know. You know what I think? Um, I think these are skills that you still need to die and that you still need to learn to die. Yeah. Yeah. But there's yeah. often enough people who come into these groups, like journalism um, students who did a lot of innovation okay. stuff. Well, you need a bit of both. You need, you need to have the toolkits, but you also need to be taught like, how to tell what a news story is. You, know, you need to like, have, you, have a judge help you know a news story. So it, it, it's just... So we are missing one panelist who promised he would be here in two minutes. So if you're just bear with us a little while longer. Yeah, will we have to talk in the microphones? Or about <laughs> is this better no doesn't work doesn't work oh yeah, now work. okay now should we test this yeah can you hear us from here so i test it too yeah let's just keep them on <laughs> It's too quiet here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, before we go into formal introductions of the panel, let's play a little game. So, who here um, has been through a formal journalism school education at some point in their lives? Um, that's more than half, I would say. Um, who got into, journalist, uh, into journalism some, on some sidetrack and did something else before? Okay, a few people. Um, who isn't into journalism, is, isn't a journalist at all, but is just very interested in the topic? One, okay, two. we hope to have some, two, two. Yeah. we hope to have something for you too. And now we, Sorry. no problem, we were just livening things up a little bit. Um, and to, just to complete this little game, um, so the title of this talk, uh, this, this uh, discussion is Why do journalism schools um, teach like it's 1996? Um, this is of course a question to fill up this room to get you all here, make you think it's going to be a splashy tabloid discussion. Um, so who thinks this title is totally wrong and unfair? One, two, two three, <laughs> four. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who thinks that the question mark should be an exclamation mark? Because it's true. <laughs> Same. Who thinks it should have at least three exclamation marks? <laughs> okay. So there's a great mix of opinions here. That should make for an interesting discussion. 
So there's one ground rule. We have 90 minutes, and we do not want to bore each other, especially us up here. We don't want to bore you down there. So we're going to make this interactive as soon as we can, and we hope for, for your input. It will not be us talking for 80 minutes with five minutes of questions time. So, and please help us make it lively. So, and with these um, preliminary words, um, I, I'm happy to welcome the panel. So, to the left we have um, Stefan Weichert. He's, um, he announced himself as a digital thinker, which is just a great way of saying that he actually is a double professor. He teaches, he teaches at um, two journalism schools in Hamburg, um, and one of them is the Hamburg Media School. Um, if you run into people from Hamburg, it will be someone from Hamburg Media School. We are here with a big delegation, 15 people, all of them very interested, bright, talented, digital journalism uh, students. One is right here. But, and Stefan Weichert is the head of the uh, department that teaches them. He's also a prolific um, book author and publisher about anything journalism, digital innovation, media innovation, disruption, you name it. And um, so, Stefan, you were the one that gave me the stern look when I asked, should it be an exclamation mark in the title? Why do you think that? Well, I think um, journalism training is um, somewhat behind. Um, and you, you know the, the uh, explanation uh, or uh, the remark, there's an elephant in the room. And um, that's uh, what I found in this case. Um, Nobody's um, accepting to admit uh, that we are always uh, behind the latest uh, developments in technologies and innovation and disruption. And um, that's why we uh, actually started this uh, discussion in Germany, um, teaching the digital um, and to, to admit uh, uh, that, that journalists are somehow uh, canaries in the coal mine. We have to, to try and experiment. And that's what I want to foster. I want more experiments. I want uh, teaching hospitals. I want startup tracks in journalism schools. And especially in Germany, we're way behind. We're way behind. And uh, we have to change that, definitely. OK, so we actually agree more than it seemed in the beginning. Um, to my left um, is Svenja Lau. She is one of uh, Stefan's students, and she study, studies uh, digital journalism um, with, a, with the aim of a master's degree. It's a two years program on and off for um, working professionals, and uh, among other things, um, among other jobs, um, Svenja works for Xing, which is the uh, German equivalent of LinkedIn. Yeah. But especially for Klartext, is a journalism project yeah. So, mm -hmm. happy to have Svenja, and um, so Svenja, y you are a student of this program, and it's, um, it's a private school, so you, you pay money for this, and you're busy anyway, juggling your jobs, and you have, have to um, study for, for this program. It is very work intensive. Um, do you think that you're actually getting your money's worth? If you think, um, will this enable me to um, have all I need to make it in journalism in maybe in five or 10 or 15 years? Mm. So, um, but I think, I think about a question there. So, um, can I be ready to be a journalist today or in the future? Because um, I think, uh, there are so many trends right now and um, which are not made by journalists because jo uh, journalism is uh, some way behind in working with tools of the past. So I think it's very difficult to be ready to be a journalist or um, in the future too. And, but in case you, you, can be, um, you, you can be prepared so for, for new tools and um, this is where journalism schools can help. So, and this is um, why I studied um, the digital journalism program in the Hammett Media School, because of um, experimenting with new tools and uh, thinking about new business models, how we can earn money, and especially of the role of journalists too. Um, so, either keep telling stories or are there new ways like um, 
being a moderator or something else. So I think we should be more sensible of what the audience is wanting. Yeah. Interesting, interesting statement. Um, so to my right is Maximiliano Koshik. Do I need to keep saying Maximiliano or? Call me Max. Max, great, Americanized. <laughs> American rule, names must be one syllable. Um, so she studied Chinese language and culture in Cologne and is now um, at the um, Deutsche Welle uh, Berlin studio in between. She um, did interesting, uh, had interesting international stops in, in Aarhus and London, part of the er Erasmus program. So you have actually had, and I'm probably missing some stops here, you can <laughs> add them in later. <laughs> um, so you haven't actually have an international perspective that enables you um, to, act, to see what's different in journalism, education, in Germany and other European countries. Um, where do you see the main differences? I have to put this on, sorry. So um, I financed my undergrads by working as a reporter for German press agency, DPA, and um, I realized afterwards that um, for working as a journalist, I needed something more. And uh, I did the Erasmus Mundus um, journalism degree, which is uh, partially set up in Aarhus Danish Journalism School and then at City University in London. Um, actually, is anybody from that program here? <laughs> One person? Okay, I know there's some more at Perugia, but shame on you guys. Um, and, uh, but after that, I decided I need still something more. I was not, I was happy with my, my studies, but, um, so I went to DW, the Deutsche Welle is the German foreign broadcaster, and I did a train, I'm doing right now a traineeship there. Um, now, uh, to make this clear, we have in Germany a very unique, um, setup, which is called the Volontariat. Um, the translation would be traineeship, but it's, you're not an intern, you're actually a full working journalist. Um, but you're getting trained there. And um, this is a model that I hopefully will explain a little bit later more, but um, which I felt um, is the one thing in Germany that is very good for journalistic education, but is completely out of the sort of academic discussion. And um, when I did uh, my program before in Denmark and Eng England, I was actually quite happy to see how good they are as an academic journalistic education. Um, there's still a lot of missing in, dis like, in perspective to innovation and like new tools and also the business side. We journalists always think we need to be poor, we don't need to m earn money, and that's, I think, a wrong thing. There's a lot of good money to be made in journalism, but um, yeah, so I think one of the biggest thing or the best things about the Erasmus Mundus program was that it was a lot about connecting, like journalism schools, journalism programs connecting and people from all around the world, journalists from all around the world connecting. And um, I think this is something that could be done better and we should maybe, for some international perspectives from the room, should discuss. Okay, so networking, connections, yeah. building possibilities apart from what's in the curriculum, apart from yeah. what gives you credits. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it, it's um, the, the fact that there are actually some people from, from this program here who are uh, now working for startups in Germany who are, um, there's a professor, one of our professors is here actually as a speaker, George Brock uh, from City University. And um, I think uh, this is one of the greatest uh, advantages, for example, for the Erasmus Mundus program that you do um, that you do get to connect with people from other from other parts of the world that um, give you a new perspective on journalism and also on what needs to be innovative because one thing is digital um, developments and uh, innovation but the other thing is also perspective on different topics especially now with like global global issues thank you broad perspective so last but not least we also have uh, John Crowley on the panel and um, John actually um, is from the other side. He's um, from the from. He's now at the business side and at the receiving end of what journalism schools produce and then get delivered to your doorstep. So um, John um, just took up a new position at uh, as editor in chief of the International Business Times in the UK, 
and he was previously the digital editor for the Wall Street Journal in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, so what do you say um, when students who've been through journalism education uh, knock at your door or virtually send you their resume, ask for, ask to be in, ask for interview, you think um, they actually have what it takes? Yes, uh, of, of course I do. I mean, but first of all, I'd like to answer the, you know, your, the question that's been posed. Um, how, how the hell do, should we expect journalism schools to be at the cutting edge when you know, many news organizations are struggling themselves to kind of figure out what's happening in this new kind of digital world? I think news organizations have a lot to do a uh, lot more work to do with journalism schools in terms of communication lines, in terms of telling um, professors and students what kind of skills we're looking for. I think we, we're very good at training uh, up interns and, uh, you know, bringing on trainees in a kind of a very selfish way because we're, you know, they're our journalists and we're investing in them. But why don't we get that conversation going uh, far, far much earlier when we can talk to journalism colleges and say, well, look, here's the skill sets that we need to learn, you know, what are you doing on your courses to kind of try, try and match that. The problem, of course, is, is that, you know, the skill sets that, you know, we were looking at, say, two, three years ago, they, they're changing now. So by the, t by the time a journalism college kind of gets its act together and institutes kind of a program or a course, you know, you're in danger of that being out of date. So how do you fix that? It's just constant communication back and forth. So more communication. Um, well, then shouldn't journalism schools uh, see this as their great chance? Um, they have they are, um, these behemoth legacy media institutions that are not fast enough uh, for development or they keep experimenting but um, in, in the wrong direction or they don't know what in the end to make of it. Um, shouldn't, couldn't journalism schools send their brightest and most entrepreneurial-minded students into these newsrooms and work with, uh, with editors, with reporters there, and form um, research and development labs and innovate together. Absolutely, I would completely agree with that. And as Svenja was saying earlier, is that you know, we've got things to learn from, from the students, particularly, say, the slightly more old fogey, kind of uh, old school, if you forgive the term, kind of journalists who, who aren't kind of digital natives, where the people now, the young students are coming through in their early 20s, you know, they've had the internet, you know, since the adults, since they were born. And a lot of, um, you know, just journalists generally um, uh, don't have the, the digital, you know, skill sets themselves. So, mm -hmm. as I said, it, it's a two-way street for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of training, I mean, we're, we're trying to train up our own journalists in, in our own newsrooms. So we're trying to teach them kind of video editing skills, how to write, uh, you know, how to perform, you know, in, in front of video coding. You know, I'm on the I'm on the lookout now for you know young data journalists at, at my at my new job. And I was thinking when we were doing this course, it's like, why aren't we kind of going into journalism schools and saying, well, these are the skills that we're teaching our staff at the moment. You know, why don't we compare notes and, and, and see what you're doing in terms of training, and then hopefully you know, there'll, there'll be a crossover in that sense. But, but what I mentioned is that um, some journalists and editors as well are a little bit afraid of, of new tools. Oh, absolutely. And challenges, of course they are, and um, I can understand it, but when there are some cooperations with schools and um, students have to do some experiments, um, it is a little bit difficult the, the editors and chiefs mostly say, yes, we, we want to learn from you mm -hmm. and um, let's make an experiment. But the people you are working with, they're completely different. They, they um, are a little bit, um, yeah, they are afraid of, of the changes mm -hmm. and the new experiment you want to do. And um, so it's, for me, it was difficult to convince them that mm -hmm. it's, um, that it's a chance to, um, plop, uh, to, to communicate with the audience. It's a new way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. You have it from the top down. The editor-in-chief kind of yeah. does this kind of fancy PR. We need to, you know, talk with journalists and students so much. You go and talk with each other. And then on the ground in the newsroom on the shop floor, there's kind of sticks in the mud where I've been doing this job for the last 20 years. I know how to do it. Uh, I'm scared. Yeah. 
uh, you know, to, to, to learn something. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I'm resistant to it. So, you know, it's it, it, the question being asked, well, why do journalism schools teach like it's 1996? There's a lot of newsrooms that still work in, in some ways like it's 1996 as well. And that, that, that's my big takeaway from, from today is that, you know, the newsrooms have so much to learn as well. Um, so h how do you make that happen? Well, hopefully people like me can, you know, be persistent and just tell people, you know, tell my staff that, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, some little dress rehearsal that we're doing. We, you know, we need to do this for real because we need to learn kind of stuff as well. Um, so in, in terms of news organisations talking with journalism schools, uh, you know, I think that can be much done much better. Uh, uh, you know, so, so I'm talking from my perspective from the UK, um, and you know, what you've got now is actually tech companies who are kind of moving into that space to actually fa facilitate fellowships. Um, I don't know if, if Matt Cook is here. He's, he runs the, the Google News Lab uh, fellowship, where um, I think he brought, I think eight journalists um, he brought through to kind of, they facilitated eight journalists joining organizations like The Times and The Guardian. And, you know, he's, he, Google have done a very good job, and Matt's done a fantastic job. There's journalists from City and, and Cardiff in London going there. But it kind of begs the question, you know, why are we letting Google do this? You know, wh why aren't we doing this ourselves? Why haven't we instituted these fellowship programs? So that it's a failure on, uh, at an industry level, I think, on the news organization's part that they haven't done this. Um, the reason why I'm, I like to ask provocative questions and think that it's not enough for journalism schools to um, think, well, if, if the newsrooms aren't up to speed, then um, how can we expect, uh, be expected to be, is actually that I um, see this from an American perspective, and that reminds me that I actually never introduced myself. <laughs> so my name is Ulrike Langer. I'm a, a freelance journalist, a foreign correspondent based in Seattle. I'm of uh, German origin, and my speciality is uh, digital media innovation. So I tour around a lot in the US, and um, I was just at, um, um, at U University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where there's a professor, um, um, his name is Robert Hernandez. He calls himself the, ma the mad scientist of uh, digital journalism. So what he does is there's a new trend. Uh, two years ago, Google Glass, he buys a few, um, he buys Oculus Rift in, in the development stadium. He confronts fronts his uh, students with these uh, tools and says, now let's experiment the hell out of it and see what we can do with this for journalism. So at the uh, approach at this journalism school is not let's wait which trends might become relevant, but let's shape the future ourselves, mm. let's shape it now. And then, when they got some results and some, like, something to show for, they actually go to newsrooms and say, look, this is what you can do with this, and here are my students, and they are the brightest, and they are the innovators, because they started first. And um, I see someone in the audience, um, do I see, the, right, that Matt, Matt Waite is in the background? So he runs the drone lab at the University of Nebraska. I'm not sure if the, the audience has a microphone. I hope I do. Would you mind tell us, telling us something about that? Uh, sure, 4.30 tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> give us the, the one minute version. <laughs> Hey, there is a microphone. Um, we started it in November 2011 uh, on the idea that flying robots with cameras were going to be a very useful tool to journalists and we're going to present all kinds of problems. So wouldn't a university be an ideal place to sort of figure out those problems and the, how they were gonna be used and how they were gonna impact ethics? before we started using them for real uh, and affecting people's lives. So that's what we did. And it's been a complete disaster of regulations and government intervention and all kinds of stuff ever since. Mm -hmm. So show up tomorrow at 4.30. Great, okay. So there was a little commercial break. <laughs> Um, if anyone has questions or criticisms or amendments to anything that's being sent here, don't be shy. Now we know that there is a microphone in the room. You can, don't have to even shout, use the microphone. 
Um, otherwise, we'll just keep talking up here, but I think that's a waste of time. So there is uh, the first question. Hi there. Uh, I'm a, a journalist and a journalism lecturer from the Netherlands. Uh, we do a lot of development in journalism and innovation, a small school for uh, journalism. I was wondering, uh, we've been um, very active in um, going into the, the working field, the practice of journalism, and asking organizations what competences do you need? Um, what do you, uh, John, is uh, the issue why news organizations, journalism organizations, are unable to find these connections with these journalism schools? Why is this not happening, this sharing of knowledge and where we need to go and so forth? Uh, well, I think, well, the, the people who are running a lot of the news organizations you were talking earlier about, um, you know, the editors right at the top asking kind of newsrooms to, to talk more with journalism colleges. But sometimes I feel is that they're going through the motions, that, that they're not really feeling it. So, um, and, and these people who tend to be at the top, who are at the top right now of the big new legacy news organizations, they're not digital natives. They, they, they don't understand it and they're scared by it and they still may have a paper to put out. So, you know, suddenly you come in and say, well, let's have a look at chat app tools or let's have a look at drone journalism. And they're thinking, oh my God, you know, I've got declining revenues anyway. You know, I've got to, you know, get a newspaper out. Perhaps I've got to pay lip service to the internet. And now you're coming up with something new for me and I've got less money in a pot to kind of pay with. But, you know, that's very short-term thinking. Um, and, yeah, what can I say? I, I think that's the problem in a nutshell. I, I also think a lot of old-school journalists are quite dismissive of journalists, you know, when they come fresh out of journalism school. It's kind of like, you know, okay, well done. You've done your course. But the real learning now is, is on the job. You haven't really, really learned how to be a journalist in there. I'm, I'm, this is not my point of view. This is... I've been devil's advocate, and I, I think that that's still quite prevalent. And I think that what's changed. So wh when I when I started out, I did a six-month course at Lambeth College. Uh, uh, it's an NCTJ certificate, National Council of the Trainer Journalists. I learned how to do shorthand, which is bloody horrible. Hundred learned how hundred words a minute, how to you know cover court cases. I got taught a little bit of media law. I got taught a little bit of public affairs, but you know, essentially I got, you know, this is how you write a news story, you know, a 500 word news story. And th that was all, you know, that I got taught. The world is different now because, you know, we're not, it's not a newspaper world anymore. It's, you know, we're having to learn digital tools, yeah? And that's why the journalists who are coming in who are digital natives, who, you know, who may be using, you know, new tools like Snapchat that we have no idea, you know, what, what to do with. You know, we've got lessons to learn as well. And, you know, th th there's a breakthrough that needs to be done. Um, but having said that, I, I think, you know, speaking from a, uh, a British experience, I think there's, there's lots of uh, journalism schools in the UK who are starting, who, who are getting, you know, what's happening and what, and what tools are there. So, you know, there's a big delegation here from Cardiff University, Richard Sambrook and his team uh, are over here and you know they run uh, an MA in computational, I think it's computational science and data journalism which is precisely what, what I'm looking for. You look at Tom Fowle at City University who's teaching an MA in interactive uh, journalism, uh, Miranda McLaughlin at Goldsmiths University who has a digital news lab who are kind of teaching coding. Um, and, you know, journalism as well. And it's not just, you know, you're learning how to code, you're learning, you're, they're also being taught how to apply that across a series of disciplines, whether it's, you know, science or health or business. So it, it's certainly getting better. I think, you know, the tanker is a bit like, you know, a tanker in the Suez Canal. It, it is slowly turning. Certainly in the UK, I can't speak for Germany, but I, I really do think it's, it's improving. Um, is there more work to be done? Absolutely. Um, so I do actually think that um, companies can do more. Um, 
Um, one way how we do this at DW is for ones that we also have our own um, media studies program. So uh, together with the University of Bonn, we have set up NMA, which is a mixture out of, uh, like it's slightly journalistic, but it's more about the entrepreneurial side of a media company. And um, these stu students get to be both in our, in our company as uh, on, in the editorial office, also in the entrepreneurial side. And um, the one thing that we do, for example, with the um, traineeship program is exactly the thing like, it's an institution in Germany that um, I'm really sad to see hasn't picked up across the world because, as I said, every time I tell I'm a trainee, people think I'm a very poorly paid intern who doesn't get to do anything. But, in fact, I'm doing a lot of things in these 18 months that I wouldn't have imagined. So we did, co like, courses in coding. We, uh, we got our own 360 camera just, like, just to play with. Um, we had an acting course. <laughs> we had a one-day acting course just to see, like, as a TV uh, reporter, like, it's really important to talk about, like, like, how do you behave as a person? And it's a lot of, like, experimental stuff. And um, I think the m reason why this hasn't picked up yet in a lot of other countries. In Germany, this can also be a bad program. So at DW, we're very experimental with it. But um, there's, I've heard about traineeships which I have basically the same... 1996 uh, program as a traineeship as do journalism schools, but um, uh, the reason why I think this is a good way to sort of for companies to to do this is because you don't, as a trainee, you don't have that position of being looked down by um, other editors because you're part of the company and they know you're invested in. I think that's actually a good thing, um, but you still get to be experimental and. It, it gives you a little bit of freedom to say like, okay, I'm, tr I'm trying something out for you as a company, um, and it might work, it might not work, um, but it's, it's good for you as a company. And um, we also try to, as a company, do this, and as a trainee, to do this together with journalism school. So I came directly from my, not directly, but I came from that MA because I knew, okay, I had a little bit of the basic skills from journalism school, I had the idea, that I got the frame set that I wanted to do something different, but I, I got the full skill set, or I'm getting the full innovative experience at the company. And um, yeah, I think uh, companies can do this, and I think one of the reasons why they're afraid to do this as well, because they always say, well, it costs money to do yeah. it, but setting up these programs, like setting this framework to be experimental, like that's where you can be cost effective because you give the same you, you give yourself the framework to say okay this is the money I'm going to invest into innovation into in experimenting and um, if it doesn't work it doesn't work but at least I've tried and uh, I have the people with me what, but, what but, I, sorry, go on. okay should we okay I start um, but I think it's not a, only about um, cooperation with companies. I uh, mentioned that a lot of young people are um, afraid of founding and mm. to be an entrepreneur. And I think that has to be uh, changing. And um, I think young people are in the position to experiment a lot. And they are understanding the tools and, and keep experimenting. And entrepreneurship is something that um, I think should, should be pushed by um, the journalism schools as well. What I would say to, to, well, to, to both of you, actually, you, you're lucky, that, very lucky that you're working for an entrepreneurial news organization that um, has the balls, really, to allow you to kind of explore that, that sense of innovation. But I would, I would go back to my point that they're investing in, in you as a, a trainee, in inverted commas, and where I think um, news organizations need to go is that they need to take it back one more level and start talking to journalism schools right at the start. The, the problem for the news organization is, you know, where is the cost benefit for that? You know, they, they've made an investment in you as a trainee, they're hoping that you're gonna stay and you know, they will, will bring you through. The, the argument to make is, is like, well, why, why should we waste our time and resource uh, spend talking to journalism schools when you know, those students may not come and work for a news organization? So maybe it's something that needs to be done at a news industry level where people need to get together. And it isn't just going through the motion saying, let's have a, you know, let's talk and yada, yada, yada. Actually, well, let's actually sit down and work out what skills we're looking for now, what skills we require of our journalists, but also in a, 
in a two-way um, it's a two-way street. So what Svenja was saying is that well, actually, what can we learn from from younger people as well? You know, S Snapchat is a great example. The Wall Street Journal um, got onto Snapchat Discover, and you know, the people who were working on it, the journalists who were in their twenties and th you know, more well, actually in their thirties, were kind of going to you know, the younger people just saying, can you tell me how you kind of work this, you know, this thing, please? So it's, you know, we, we need to learn too. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, there was one example where um, there was a picture that was being sent and me, I was going, well, wh where's the text on this kind of picture explaining what it is? And this person was using, well, I don't need to send any text on the picture. And I was going, why? And I went, well, it's fine. I can just send this image. You know, that's, I'm sharing an emotional image. I, you, you don't need to hold somebody by the hand. So even somebody like me, who you know would like to think I'm on top of digital innovation, I was being taught a lesson my, myself about how young people mm. were using Snapchat. But for you know old school journalists to actually to be told you know to admit that actually perhaps we've got something to learn too, you know, takes a lot. Okay. You know. um, there have been now several people in the audience who want to chime in. Yeah. Um, You've, to, you've, spo to, you've spoken about legacy news organizations, you've spoken about you know, the relationship between uh, academic institutions and newsrooms, but one thing that I've come across is actually you know, you've got this, the trainers themselves in these institutions come from legacy mm. uh, organizations, they are legacy trainers. And I've been in situations when I, I've been, I went to my old university recently and spoke to someone there and was explaining, you know, your students need to be prepared to go into jobs that would, you know, a Snapchat producer, or you need, you need, to, your video journalists need to know that their, that their videos that they produce will be tested, you know, A/B testing, and some, and the reaction was, oh my goodness, this is completely against Ofcom rules, and how can this be possible? How can this be allowed? And I think that there's a, a big discussion needs to happen around keeping the trainers abreast of the latest mm. in innovation. Mm. Um, the students are, are automatically going to be interested yeah. in these things. So are the newsrooms. But what about the trainers? I think there's someone in the audience who's very well qualified to say something about that. Damien, would you? Okay. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely, you're right. Uh, uh, myself, I'm, I'm, I used to be a journalist. I'm not a journalist anymore. And I'm not considering myself as a teacher, <laughs> neither. But I'm both. Um, I'm crafting training programs for journalists, young journalists and students. Um, and the whole purpose of that is bringing the entrepreneurial mindset uh, to the students. So we, um, we've built a program four days in a row inside uh, a startup accelerator in Belgium, uh, which I co-funded uh, four years ago. And I'm working with EX, which is a university in Brussels. And um, yeah, it, it makes sense to bring the mindset and the entrepreneurial mindset uh, to those students because they don't have to wait to the legacy media to bring them and to give them jobs. Um, you know, the market is full, crowded. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of students who want to be journalists and they will shift because they won't find um, jobs. And so the whole purpose is make them entrepreneurs of their own career first. And so I bring all the, um, the students inside the Startup Accelerator. I'm using tools um, like Business Model Canvas, Lean Canvas. I've built the one called Lean Journalism Canvas to help them figure it out for how to build the reports, how to build the projects, and actually thinking about a report like a startup. Each report has its own business model, so you have to craft it, you have to think about the storytelling of your stuff. And we put those reports on crowdfunding platforms. And since three years now, we've managed to uh, publish more than 50 projects for more than 100,000 euros uh, funded. And it works pretty well. And all the, all the students won't be entrepreneurs, won't be freelancer, for sure. Maybe they will have jobs, and some have uh, great jobs inside legacy media now. But the more important thing is to make them meet people, meet startups, meet entrepreneurs, pitching, pitching their project in front of startups, and startups pitching in front of students. It makes connection, and it works, yeah, very well. Can um, I just oh, ask, wait, answer wait. first? That might have not yeah. been the exact yeah. answer to the question, right? Because I think um, that's the biggest elephant in the room. 
who is training the trainers. Um, and that's the hard part. Um, we don't know. Um, I'm missing a clear financial commitment um, of the schools and universities um, to um, yeah, foster innovation, education of the, of the trainers. Um, and it's very hard, um, for example, in Germany to get good, good trainers for virtual rea reality, let's say, or 360 degrees video. Um, there might be only a handful of people who do that. So what I would like to address is that we are all in the same boat. And if we can guarantee a good education on the training side, and if the trainers are not well educated, we, we mislead our students uh, to, to a false path and, and they mm. wouldn't found any job. So um, how could we solve it? Um, we, we should accept that we ourselves also have to train mm. uh, a lot and, and have to be here on innovation study tours in Perugia, talk to people, um, do some, some expertise, do some experiments. Uh, I think the, uh, it's, it's all about surviving and, and if we don't try um, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, tackle uh, the problem by the root, is that the right expression? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, then we can't um, guarantee uh, that journalism is uh, evolving itself and, and Snapchat and uh, Yik Yak and, and we have all uh, new interesting um, tools and um, chat apps and social platforms and we, we definitely have to uh, experiment and, and find out uh, how we can use them. And we only can do it together, together with uh, faculty members, uh, with trainers, uh, with our students, and of course, uh, with journalists from the newsrooms. So, uh, well, I think that might be a solution. Um, try. Well, what would you say is the biggest hindrance in the um, journalism academic world? Um, to my mind, it is often that the, the school themselves is willing, the trainers are willing, the staff is willing, but the, the curricula have to be fulfilled. It somehow has to be crafted in a way that it fits into a box. Yeah, these are some, uh, sometimes bureaucratic reasons. Um, curricula are um, somewhat written in stone. You can't change them so fastly. We, we tried at Hamburg Media School. To, to accept the curriculum as organic. It has to evolve itself with the market uh, needs and the technologies, uh, but still it's very complicated sometimes, if you know universities. Uh, I think the journalism schools uh, in, in Germany, we have three or four well-renowned, they are very advanced. They have very advanced training because um, um, Half of them belong to publishing houses and, and they should be interested in, in guarantee the best and excellent uh, training programs. Uh, I think universities are more the problem. And you, you um, mentioned that um, they sometimes have legacy trainers from legacy media and uh, th there's a kind of logic in it. Uh, because um, if you had a 30 years career as a journalist, uh, you might be going to a journalism school and sure you can can train young people, of course, but you have to get yourself trained as well. Otherwise, you only train legacy <laughs> methods, uh, research trainings, and um, which is not um, modern or adequate or digital in, in a way what we need right now. I find one of the biggest issues is flexibility, as you said, and um, I think uh, what I've experienced as a like student at journalism school as well as now in the traineeship is that it's underestimated how fast you can learn. Like there's courses that take ages on things that you don't need that much time to learn. Like, like it's most important is that you, like that you, at journalism school that you get a new mindset and that you lose the fear of trying out things and that you like also get a broad experience and you don't need like weeks and weeks of one topic like sometimes for example, for example um yeah for example like one big issue for online journalism is always titles and teasers like <laughs> writing a catch, catchy title and teaser and um there's been a lot of discussion in uh, german online media um on how to do that for example that it's both seo uh compatible but it's still catchy it's it's funny and um um, of course you need an input in that, but you don't need to do three 
like weeks or like you don't need to do it over like one semester once like once a week it's fine to do it like for a two-day course and you get the gist and once you get working you actually have I don't know your notes on that and you like you get practice like I think uh, that is the one thing like like students I, or I as a student always felt kind of frustrated when I felt like do I need this on this like long path of studying and um, now I get rather like short courses where I get an idea of it and then I can can I, I can use it or can I can't use it or won't use it and I think that's one thing that journalism schools, for example, need more. And f yeah, like flexibility on what's important. But like, if that time is freed up, what would you fill it with? I would fill it with new stuff. I would say like get, like don't get necessarily leg leg legacy teachers, but get somebody from an innovative pro project and have them talk for a day like you did with us. You came in for, I think, how many? Like three hours to a program? And we did like, we did a little workshop with you on entrepreneurial journalism. And um, also to say, like, I don't necessarily feel that um, my company builds me up as like to be their, like to be their investment, but more like to be uh, a good journalist that goes out of there. And I think, yeah, like young people don't, necessarily need that much time to like spend with one topic like we do have a short attention span nowadays that's an issue I know <laughs> but um, also it's get also it faster <laughs> but you also get it faster yeah and um, uh, it, it gives you flexibility to open up for new things like who had who would have thought like a year ago that snapchat would become an issue in in newsrooms like Honestly, I used it like since three years. No, but like three years ago, Snapchat was a funny app and it was like more like thought of as a like dodgy sexting tool. And <laughs> and now it's actually like a serious topic for, for journalists. And um, uh, you know, like, yeah, like I think lot, not a lot, not a lot of, um, uh, you can't use that in a curriculum like as a like a real course like snapshotting 101 but you can do like a three day or like a two day or one day course maybe even just as a snapchat <laughs> story uh, on how to use it and and people will pick it up you, you, might, so, be so you, you might be teaching the teachers I think in a way so, and just back sorry I'll just jump in on, on Fergus's point I think it's it, it, and I completely agree with Stefan I was going to say that phrase elephant in the room for you know lectures who maybe have a, Exeter journalism kind of 10 years ago, the landscape has completely changed. And perhaps, you know, some of the teachers, you know, there's a few home truths for them to answer as well, you know, that they've got to learn. So, you know, the news organizations, you know, need to kick up the butt. Perhaps some of the teachers do as well, you know, just to change their attitudes. And then from the students, you're doing bloody great, but maybe, you know, be tenacious. So in, if just, t you know, if you're in the newsroom, just say, well, we need to do something else. Or if you're teaching, just saying, well, actually, I know this course backwards. I probably know it better than you, to be frank. You know, we need to be doing something else. So I think that's, a, you know, in terms of my three messages for, you know, for news orgs, teachers and students, I think that would be my, my takeaways. But, you know, just feed, tell us, in a way, what we're doing wrong. Yeah, it would be great if there was um, something to combine these, to have maybe for, should I? Okay, I do it. <laughs> um, maybe maybe four uh, days of um, learning new tools like Snapchat and maybe to how organize an editorial team, a, a new editorial team and some stuff. And um, then the other time you, you can work and, uh, what, and, and put this into an editorial team you, who are, who you are, where you're working and um, so put it in it what you learned. Yeah. So that would be great, and uh, this is what I'm doing actually. And um, but it makes fun. Yeah. So I'm a reporter, and over the past 15 years, I've I've been working for a school of journalism in Milan, teaching and crafting programs for my students. So now I'm full of doubts, hearing what you're saying. And so, <laughs> so to me, when you talk about Snapchat and new things, new digital stuff, to just, I mean, tools, not curses. So the question, especially for Stefan, is if you had the opportunity to project from scratch the School of Journalism of the future, what subjects, what titles would you choose for your school? I mean, titles. So what subjects? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a big one. Um, mm. Well, I, we were talking about these kind of uh, things. I, I believe in news labs. I believe in interfaces between journalism, startups, and academia. Um, I believe in pre-acceleration process. I believe uh, that students have to do their own business models. Um, and um, you might have to explain the term pre-acceleration uh, process. Oh, could you do this for me, please? <laughs> no, very, you came up with very it. Hard. <laughs> It's very hard to explain uh, you know, if you I've don't know the, if you're not fam familiar with the word. Yeah, you know acceleration, right? Yeah. The, the startup. Uh, so pre-acceleration means uh, that you work with, with students, uh, with graduate students, uh, before they go into the acceleration process. You, you do it like a kind of, um, yeah, pre, like the prefix pre means uh, um, before work, before getting really started into the acceleration process. So that's what we're doing right now. Every student has to develop their own project, and that's why we're here also in Perugia. Everybody has to think about their project, develop it further, uh, talk to people, get feedback. Uh, we had some pitches with the students, uh, with some professionals who so gave them feedback. So that would be um, one way um, to, to, um, uh, to think uh, of what universities or journalism schools should be uh, in the future or now. Uh, and I think that's uh, very important uh, to think of them as, um, well, as I said, news labs, innovation labs, um, um, because uh, this really fosters innovation in, in cooperation with, with uh, partners in the, in the newsrooms. So I wouldn't name a tool or a track, or I would, ever, I would say research is, is imp important than ever, but um, it doesn't have to be necessary the way we did it for uh, 40 years. Uh, it has to be uh, include data journalism, of course, because we all will work as journalists in the future with data. So that's definitely one topic I would put inside a curriculum uh, to, to do research on statistics and data and, and uh, ask the question how to visualize uh, them, to put stories in them and to read them. Does that answer the question a little bit? You mean data something? Data visualization. Then what else? Do you mean something like organize a new editorial team, something like that, and think about new business models and experimenting with new tools like Snapchat, as you said? And um, there would be a few more in the future, so of course. And um, I think entrepreneurship is. is very important as well. So I, I'm not. Um, I'm working as an editor right now, and I, um, in, in the near future, I won't be an entrepreneur. But I think it's very important to, um, for a young journalist to, to, to have a name and be popular to other journalists. So I think these are very important things. Yeah, so, so you're looking for the five key elements of, of a journalism. And I think there always will be research, there will always be storytelling, uh, there will always be uh, entrepreneurial journalism in, in, a, in a sense, uh, maybe also computa uh, computational skills. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure, so sure about that. I, I don't think journalists need to, uh, to uh, have, do computational stuff, uh, but they should uh, understand how it works. Um, or how, how they should work with, with developers uh, and, and, uh, and programmers. And with the audience, I think also with the audience. Yeah, and that's my last point. Yeah, yes, it's the last sorry. point. <laughs> Curating uh, will, be, uh, will be more important in the future uh, than ever. Audience engagement. That, yeah, I mean, the, that's the same for me. Audience engagement, curating stuff, uh, working with, uh, with our viewers and readers. Um, that will be uh, most important. So that would sorry, be like the five key no, points. Wait, no, no, John. I think there's... Someone in the very back who's been wanting to, or is it given up? No, Dan Gilmore. Who was it? Yeah. Dan Gilmore, I think. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Make yourself you. noticed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Did, didn't you want to say something? Sorry, sir. No? Hi. Hi, I'm, I come from Serbia, uh, a small country in the east. You might have heard of it. Um, I uh, work for this uh, media development organization. We do most of our work with uh, small local media, meaning outside Belgrade. Uh, the situation with the freedom of media in Serbia is uh, getting worse every day, and um, there is an important aspect to digital journalism in general that uh, might not apply to uh, some other countries, and that is the fact that um, what is left of freedom of media is uh, strongly attached to online journalism, which is why we focus our work in this, in this field. Now, one of the problems we've faced when working with um, journalists from small local media is that whatever the quality of knowledge and skills we provide them with, once they go back uh, to their office, uh, they can only use it as far as their immediate environment is capable of understanding the importance of this, and this is not always the case whether it be uh, on uh, resource level or on, or on the level of awareness of their editor. Uh, simply, they're not able to implement all this. And I simply wondered if any one of you has ever experienced uh, this situation, the challenge of basically trying to change the whole environment through a single, usually young journalist, uh, usually working you know, down the ladder in the company hierarchy. So that's it, thanks. gather some questions and then try to answer them. Uh, it's been mentioned that uh, legacy journalists, it's, it's a really cruel term, but anyway, f folks that have put in 30 years learning their craft and the, then going... The thing is we all will be legacy journalists once in a while. I feel like a legacy journalist about once a week, frankly. Yeah. Um, but I think the point more is when folks like this who, you know, when you're learning in the newsroom, you sit at the knee of somebody and you understand how this craft works, right? And the content that you're producing at the age of 50 is fundamentally different in its depth and nuance and context and understanding to what it was when you were 21 and that's how it should be. And those people are not in our newsrooms quite often. You know, a, a lot of broadcasters and news organisations have made it uh, economically attractive for people over the age of 50 to leave, you know, voluntary redundancy programs. And that's... So, one question I have is, these folks are eminently important in journalism education, but their skill sets um, are... Uh, the, the English term is on the nose. No, they, they, they lose traction very quickly. What can journalism schools, and so I'm putting this question to you guys, what can journalism schools and media outlets do to keep those skill sets refreshed? Because it's in the industry of, it's in the interest of the sector to do so. What kind of innovations have you seen or would you want to see to move this out of 1996? Okay, so we have if I get this right, we have two questions, one from the gentleman in the back. How can um, the infusion with new ideas and new skills that young journalists learned be transported back and made useful in smaller newsrooms where all too often then um, these, these uh, young journalists are hindered to um, evolve and infuse their institutions with what they learned? And the other one was how can um, seasoned journalists be, who, which have in, uh, very valuable skills um, be made even more valuable by enabling them to come up uh, to learn the new uh, crafts too, the new skills. So these two questions, and who would like to chime in? Maybe I can start with the first one from you. Um, um, I, um, I have to make to make an ex experiment with um, with a public broadcaster, and the problem was um, really the the editors in chief wanted that we find some new ways to um, to communicate with our audience, and um, they liked my ideas and they they wanted it, but especially um, the people I was working with, um, they were a little bit scared of of these changes and um, I think this is a point that makes it difficult because um, you just can um, involve your, what you learned in, in, um, to your colleagues when they are open to your ideas 
And um, I, I don't know, is it what you meant? <laughs> Yeah, okay, because um, I think we should all be more open. Um, I especially want to learn from, from um, journalists because I'm, I'm a student now and I'm a young editor and want to learn, but um, I think we can learn from each other. I think uh, also to your question, you need to be open to failure because um, uh, people are like, I think one of the biggest lessons I've had with this, um, like talking about innovation, is that things can fail and there can be editorial offices who are not ready for it. And what you have to do then, like when you see that failure, is to see, okay, why didn't it work? Um, so uh, at DW, we have uh, a big um, department on social media, which doesn't do the social media as in kind of like feeds our Twitter channels and everything, but like evaluates what is out there and we have over 30 language departments in our company and so we source a lot of stories through social media and look like what do people in certain countries discuss and uh, for example uh, currently uh, one story we're looking at is um, it's two years now since the Chibok girls have been um, taken and nobody's uh, still talking about bring back our girls and um, this is what we do, for example, with uh, our uh, African department. And um, but this doesn't always work. So we had a couple of stories in like in this in this project where um, we realized, okay, it's 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 not working at all. Um, we can't get this cool, fancy hashtag stories going. And why did why didn't that work? And then we actually said, okay, we're just gonna evaluate. We found some mistakes, and like, let's give it another half year and then try again. But often enough, I find one big issue with like innovative, motivated people coming in. It, that situation happens, the, the newsroom's not ready, but then it just dies. And nobody's actually evaluating because they're afraid of the critique, of, of accepting the mistakes they've made. And um, I think that is one, one important lesson, like uh, fail, fail again, fail better, you know? Think of the sentence, um, so we, we try it in the past and it doesn't work, so now we w won't do it again. So um, Maybe George Brock would like to say something to this. We had dinner with him last night and he told us um, a lot of interesting things about, um, well, it was a whirlwind of ideas, but one thing you said um, was that um, newsrooms do not kill their ex failed experiments fast enough. Maybe you would like to say something to that or, or something else. You got the microphone anyway. You you made. Yeah, you uh, oh, yeah, we will come to that. We'll just keep the conversation going. You I have not Dan. forgotten that. You mean Dan. 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 No, oh, Dan. Yeah, sure. Do you want George? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. This was a total, um, total lapse. We were talking to so many people, of course, Dan. <laughs> No, no, you were going to say something else. Total lapse of reason. This one's dead. We need more. All right. Uh, sorry, I was late from a long walk up the hill. But uh, I'm, com as anyone who knows me would understand, I'm totally in favor of everything innovative that one can do and that. Uh, try everything, you know, play with all the shiny new toys, do all these things, use entrepreneurship uh, in, in things. But I, I, I'd like to suggest that journalism education should stop being quite as obsessed with training journalists, traditional journalists, as it has been, and think of itself as a, under, undergraduate I'm talking about, think of itself as a, if, if it's done right, a wonderful liberal arts degree that includes uh, very high uh, skills in critical thinking and communicating. And that those, that combination uh, happens to be great for someone who wants to be a journalist, but also a whole lot of other things. And that J schools should think of themselves in the broader context for the future. And, one of those contexts is actually quite close to, in fact, I believe, part of journalism now, which is 
the advocacy people in NGOs and other places who are doing outright journalism, like Human Rights Watch, American Civil Liberties Union, and others. Uh, there's a whole market there for journalism schools to serve in, in those and other ways. So I'm, I want, yes, I want the best journalism training there is, but it can be applied very broadly, and I don't think we're thinking about doing that uh, hard enough. Okay. Um, we're at the second question. We are. Yeah. Yeah. Is someone yeah, um, can, can answer I'll, this I'll, one? I'll, I'll try and answer it um, to the woman's question about re retaining, uh, what was it, journalistic talent for people who, who are slightly older. Um, at the journal, we, we did have a, a training program, and I think actually journalists in newsrooms should be trained, actually. I, I, I do think there should be, you know, obvious, I mean, that's an obvious statement to make. Um, and at the journal, what we did, we did everything from teaching them about what our business model was, which is what, you know, certainly something I didn't learn 20 years ago about business models and journalism. You didn't, you know, that wasn't part of the, the debate. But we teach them, as I said, video skills, video editing skills, even, even, even coding. But they've got to meet us halfway. And what I found perhaps with perhaps slightly more older journalists is that they are resistant. So that doesn't mean we should give up and just say, well, you don't want to learn stuff you but w we need to think about ways of persuading you know older journalists who haven't you know who, tr who trained before the digital age took off about you know best practice um, but it's 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 a two-way street uh, I, what I would say actually just just to a point before that was made by Stefan that I I do think that it is useful for for journalists to have computational training um, I don't think it's actually it shouldn't be mutually exclusive. You can have a journalist who have data, you know, coding skills, and you know, learn how to spot and and and, and sniff out a story. I wouldn't say every journalist needs to do that, but certainly in our newsroom, where the big gap is in in resource, is journalists who who may have some you know coding skills and licks, and also you know have that old journalistic kind of head on them as well. Um, we're finding that really useful. So that is working for us in that sense. I didn't say that it's working. I said it's one path. Yeah. So. yeah. I, w I would say as well that um, you, like, it's, 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 it's a bit of a difficulty to, because some of the senior, um, like, reporters not necessarily, like, are willing to learn it. I, I, I've not experienced that so far, but, um, I also find it sometimes assuring that they don't need it because what I mostly learn from them is that they have just an impeccable experience and view on, 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 on stories. I think uh, with all this discussion on innovation, we sometimes forget the sort of stories and the content that is very important <laughs> and uh, that it's great to be able to like do your story in like code your own website or do a like multimedia story or whatsoever and like I, I like that, I'm, I'm a geek on that, and that's uh, why I wanted to go to a multimedia company, but um, the one thing I'm always very baffled to see is um, when, when it comes especially to political uh, stories, um, like how the, the argumentation that goes on in, in a newsroom, and like that is the one thing where I feel like senior reporters, they have the experience, and this is the one thing that they bring to, to the newsroom, you know? Um, I, don't, I don't need them to be beacons of innovation. I need them to be the beacons of like knowledge, of experience, of, 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 of the great perspective. Um, and um, I think fostering that, like don't like make a hierarchical newsroom, like don't have the hierarchy also in journalism schools. I found it very refreshing in, at the Danish School of Journalism to see how unhierarchical the, the structure th there is, like how professors are very like looking to have a good contact to their students but at the same time give them the broad perspective and I think like that needs to be fostered with like the generations of journalists. But I think um, yeah, the question is how you uh, tell the story as well. So there, there is of course politics um, and how you, you um, get on the information is very important but um, the audience is changing and you have to reach your audience and this is how. Uh, this is a big question. So, how can I tell the story that I reach um, the most of of the audience? Yes, but at the same time, I would say the biggest stories that, for example, have been broken. I don't know if has any of you been to uh, Marcus Beckerdahl's talk last night. 
I know his, uh, he's had a funny German accent, <laughs> but um, so he's just doing a blog. It's so unfancy. It's really just like a title page in its words, and it's like, it's, but it's, this is the kind of still story that was like one of the biggest issues in, in German politics last year because uh, they are reporting on the NSA, um, um, what is it called? Um, somebody from the Germans help me. Um, so basically, since NSA scandal broke, uh, we, have a, we have a committee in the German parliament uh, where they talk about what the German implications in this are. And um, so they were blogging about this and I'm not going to get the details, they were charged with treason and um, just for this blogging that they were doing and this was a big journalistic issue and it's, it's, this wasn't about any of the big innovation tools, you know, and I but think... It was, it would, it um, came so, it came so, so big because, um, because of other media companies are publishing the story and um, I think that's a big point. So, how do you tell a story that that the audience um, that reaches the audience? And um, I, I think if it's just um, published in this blog, maybe he wouldn't have um, these these um, this big communication with with the user, the audience. I'm still thinking about this lady's um, question about the older journalist. I think she raised a very valuable point and we haven't really gotten to the depth of it. Um, what about intergenerational, very agile teams that are formed um, to answer the big questions, to produce stories, and we have seasoned journalists who have the depth and the knowledge of a certain topic. We have the younger journalists. We might have coders and designers. And together they, um, they, they come up with ideas of how to tell this story in the, in the best depth, in the best um, multimedia manner, or text, or mobile, or messaging, or, or data set, or whatever. But these teams then disperse again. And they are being um, built new if the need arises for another topic. Would that work, John? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's a good point. I, I would agree with that. I, I, I definitely believe in kind of matrix management where you kind of break, break down traditional reporting lines. And I was talking about this yesterday in relation to, to data journalism where in an old school journalistic environment, you'd get a story idea, you'd write it, you'd give it to your editor, he gives it to the desk, they edit it, and it goes through several people. Um, what more senior seasoned experienced journalists have inside their head which you referred to Matt, is is kind of not residual knowledge of a subject and what i'm interested in is, is in the intersection of that knowledge and how you may you know uh, publish that in a visual way so this, that's why I'm, i've got a particular interest in you know data visualization and coding where you may have a, an older journalist who has that knowledge in his head doesn't know how to kind of visualize it goes over to what you would call a unicorn or a data coder on the, you know, uh, on the, because they're so rare. Yeah, um, and you work with them to present a kind of, a, perhaps a data viz and a story uh, around it. And it's breaking through those kind of old school journalistic uh, reporting structures. Um, that is, you know, that is sometimes met with resistance as well, but it has worked very well in my last job at the journal where we've kind of built these projects, which w would never have happened, you know, before. I think what's really important in that context is that journalists uh, and also that kind of uh, attitude needs to be maybe started to like get rid of in journalism schools that journalists should stop thinking of themselves as that one unique person and more as of like team players and get rid of the uh, also in regards to like the being inspired by like these seasoned colleagues that um, everybody needs to be a journalist as Dan said like not everybody needs to be to do, do, be able to do everything, but everybody needs to be ready to contribute their part, like to contribute their passion, you know, um, and not be like, oh, I can do this all on my own. Like we're all supposed to be juggling like five different skills at a time and we don't need to do that. And uh, uh, it's great to experiment with all of them at journalism school because there you can find your path, you can find your passion. But uh, like 
don't be expected to be that one great journalist who can do it all and who will win all the prizes, but be ready to be a team player in, in a newsroom. That's a really good point, but also, you know, the byline, having your byline on oh, the Oh, yeah, like, be, this is the, the one level. issue, I, I hate this so much, honestly. Uh, I you think, hate having your own byline? Yeah, I think Why? this is ridiculous. I think it's, it's, I think what, like, nobody cares nowadays uh, if you see a good, funny, well done, exp explanatory video on any news channel, like any, any social media channel, you don't care who made it. You're interested in what's happening. And especially in Germany, we have a culture of, like I think in the US as well, like this culture of, um, of, the, of the ego, of the author's ego, which we really need to get rid of. Like we're not, like if every, like when I see the, the amount of bylines, I don't, I don't know, like I know, for example, I know who made the Panama paper research because they're German thing, but I don't care. I was more interested in the leak and in the information and in the, in the, in the stories that were written. And um, it's great and they should always be, like they should always be credited, but uh, this is not the reason why we do this. Well, maybe the Panama Papers are not the best example because that was yeah, a huge uh, one-year yeah, international team effort. Yeah, but that's the that's the that's the but reason. You said something else very interesting. You said that um, we are byline crazy. Now that contradicts everything that uh, young journalists have been taught. You need to be your own brand. You exactly. Need to be, how can you be your own brand if you always keep your name back? Because your work should speak for yourself and not like you know like. When, when you do good work, people will notice and they will approach you and you will, you will like, find the right people to work with. And uh, like, you're not necessarily, like, I, like half of the people who like, I know by name, but I don't really know what they do, but I rather like, see good stuff and then I'm like, oh, okay, so like, I later found out who did that. Like, uh, I, I think um, if you do good work, you'll, you'll do your path. Like, if you have a passion, you, you, you find the people because you get to work with other people, but you don't necessarily be, need to be that like like business card ready person. Are there a few questions? Yeah, um, over there. Um, so my question is sort of coming from the perspective of someone who is interested in journalism, but a few steps back, not even enrolled in a program yet, um, because clearly things are changing very drastically and very quickly. Uh, so my question is that with all those changes, um, to be a successful journalist today, do you really even need a journalism degree? Hmm. <laughs> Provocative questions. You said that you like them. Can we broaden it? Have, have we ever needed a journalism degree? Yeah. It's a free yeah. profession. <laughs> well, do you, I guess to clarify, do you think that to really be successful at this, do you need to go to a specifically journalism school? Um, do you think that's necessary to really be able to do this job and do it well? Hmm. So, so I think it depends, right? So what, what do you want to do? Do you want uh, to be a journalist who writes um, um, a report in the newspaper or do you want to be someone who um, maybe be in one, in sometimes an editor-in-chief and can organize in, um, your editorial team? And I think there, there are so much journalism schools who are dealing with, um, with topics like uh, business models and, and organizing an editorial team. And it's not about being a journalism school, it's maybe both be a journalism school and a business school. And um, I think journalism schools can be more open and then you get a very good education. Yeah. Okay, there's another question. Hi, I'm Ali. I uh, study the same program as Max uh, on the panel. Um, I studied in Aarhus and also in Hamburg. And but my journalism training, mostly on the Erasmus Mundus program, was very academic in nature and not very practical. Um, but I think the the fact that so many people here and are you know sharing knowledge and sharing ideas and sharing everything. Journalism is a very ref self-reflective industry from what I can see from this festival. So I think that um, training, in a sense, I think comes back to what a lot of people have said, like you need to have some core sort of ideas about storytelling and about um, how to create content and where to look for certain information and all of those kind of things. Um, and, but my real question is, like, is there a case to be made that we need more ongoing training in, in industry 
And then perhaps the journalism schools and universities are, um, should be equipped to make those journalists as kind of flexible minds that are very critical and very um, on board with new ideas, but not necessarily the full package ready for the industry. I don't know, what, what do you guys think? That's a topic we hadn't addressed so far. It's uh, called vocational training, um, which means further education. Um, that's very important, I think, because uh, it still uh, remains a dialectic process. And even if you're 20 years in the newsroom, uh, you might need eventually uh, further education, right? Uh, so that's where also we as a school build a strong expertise in, in executive education and these vocational programs. So what our students um, are doing, they're already professionals. They're already working uh, in the field, um, even if they're still young like Svenja, but they already have uh, work. And so it's uh, uh, that what vocational means. You, you're working and studying. Um, um, uh, parallel you know? and I think that's it's getting more and more important but <clears throat> what I'm missing is um, this lack of, of financial commitment again from the publishing houses mm. um, and that uh, that's what's uh, a challenge for us as well um, if the the whole industry got no more money to invest in, in vocational training or in education as such uh, we, gen we have a pro problem in general because they don't want to um, send people to, to these trainings and to the, to the education. And that's when uh, um, the publishing houses even get more problems uh, in, in uh, being up to date with the digital uh, developments. So, yeah, well, it's a dilemma. I feel like which, uh, a way to connect both these, these issues uh, that you both named is um, that we all just need to connect more. I mean, the one reason why you should go to journalism school, why you should, what, what is, could be good motivation is to connect with like-minded like people, not only students, but trainers, um, like people coming in. Um, and this is something that also needs to happen just like more between companies and journalism schools. Like, they have these uh, legacy journalists who can come in and teach about the experience. But at the same time, they should be able to send maybe staffers to journalism school and give them primers, you know, like, and, and that's, learn. And, and learn and just like have more of these exchanges. And also, yeah, like, I think it comes down a lot, like this, this dilemma comes a lot down to flexibility and like open-mindedness. And um, yeah, and th the reason why, why the reason why we all came here to Perugia is the same sometimes why you go to journalism schools because you can connect and uh, this, is, this is something that you need because, which goes also back to my <laughs> issue with, um, with egos, is that uh, journalism is a team play and like there is great, un there are great unicorns which like should be fostered in their, with their genius but it's also important that you like know how to play together and I think yeah, like Panama has showed that, like that, like somebody tweeted that last week was like, how can foreign like journalists keep the secret for a year? <laughs> and you know, that's the great team play that we need. And um, yeah, and I think uh, fostering that in, in journalism school is really important. But it's also a cultural problem. And I think Germany is ma making this especially hard on seasoned jour journalists to stay innovative because we have these absurd age restrictions. Um, there's this the wonderful Neiman Fellowship in the U.S. You can apply at any age. In fact, they don't even ask you what how old you are. This is um, like any um, uh, any appli job application. You don't send a photo. You don't uh, state your age because it doesn't matter. I don't know of a single German scholarship program. Um, I mean, how if 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 a 58-year-old uh, journalist came and says, I want to do a digital master. Would, would you be able to take him onto the class? Yeah, sure. Has sure. it ever happened? I mean, do no. Uh, <laughs> the, older, the oldest student, in a, in a sense, uh, she's like 43 now, which is pretty young. I'm, I'm 42 as well. So, But this is, you know, sure we would take 50-year-old people, of course. But the, the media organizations don't think that that's a good investment because they will, oh, it's just only got three or four years or five yeah. years ahead of them. Whereas why? I mean, I want to keep working till I'm 70, I think. 
Or yeah, we, we should we should stop uh, age discrimination immediately. Of course. I think we should also stop like. What I found really helpful was that I didn't do my undergrads as a journalist. So I worked as a journalist already and I, I decided like actively against it. I was like, I want to study something else first and uh, I don't want to be, like maybe I don't want to be a journalist and by that time the media landscape was changing a lot and uh, like I, I'm, I, I'm happy I did study it and I actually, what I, uh, and what I liked a lot about the program was that it was actually academic because it gave me still time to ponder and to like realize because is this what I want and also just talk about more about like frame sets of journalism. I feel like a lot of the discussion we're having here, for example, is also about Western media and uh, like we're living in a global world and uh, like the, what you said in the back, like the, the media training in, in, um, in the southern hemisphere is completely different. They're, like, they're, for example, doing a lot of mobile reporting because it's much easier and uh, like better to be done for them. And, um, um, but uh, I've lost my track. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, but like, this was something great we did at Erasmus Mundus that it wasn't about just like Western journalists trying to be very innovative, but like thinking, okay, how are we actually reporting about crises? Like, how are we reporting? Why are we always taking a certain kind of framework? Like, I had like I had classmates there from from Rwanda, and when we talked about like things like the bystander, fan, like apathy phenomenon, all these things in framing, I was the first time able to hear this from an experience from like a, like a Rwandan journalist, and not from you know like a like a sorry white old male professor. <laughs> and I think, as we said, media trainings are keep going on, they're never ending. And so, of course, there can be students which are more than 40 years old. And I will be someone of them. I hope they're yeah. more than four years old. <laughs> 40. 40. Or, or sorry. 40. And um, I think, yes, as I said, um, there is, it's not a question of the, the age because we are all journalists and we keep learning. We should keep learning. Our whole life. Our whole life, right. So we're nearing um, the end of our 90 minute time slot and there are probably a lot of hungry stomachs in this room. Um, and so are there any more questions from the audience? Some, something we didn't touch on, not, not, not in enough depth, anything? That does not seem to be the case. Does anyone on this podium have something to say that is, needs to be said? We, we hope that we gave you some good yeah. ideas to think about in the next days, and uh, we would love uh, and be happy if you talk to us and remain into the, the, the discussion about the future of our jobs. Okay, thanks. Then, um, then thanks a lot to um, panelists for your great contribution. Special thanks to, to Stefan um, for coming up with the idea of actually pitching a um, podium here. So this is a joint project of the International Journalism <laughs> Festival and Hamburg Media School. And, um, thank, you, thank you for moderation. <laughs> and thanks, of course, for the audience for sticking with us for 90 minutes. That's a marathon. <laughs> thank you.